Halo. <laughs> eh. Allah. <laughs> ah. You might check out the other page. See everyone. Looks very summary for some of you. Hmm. That's great. Hmm. Well, hopefully we can all just kind of settle, settle in deep within ourselves right now, shifting gears. One way we can settle in is just letting the attention go somewhere in the body where it's naturally drawn. So it's a kind of landing. Noticing the sensations at some point at the base of the spine, bottom of our sit bones. So we receive, we can receive the sensations there that connect us between the earth and sky. The key word can be the receiving and ultimately the initial moments of receiving are unknown. So there is always that courage and delicacy of connecting the attention to what we don't know. Each moment is new. And from that place of connection with Earth, can be helpful to let the attention notice sound wherever the attention is naturally drawn with this thing with the hearing. Again, that emphasis on receiving texture, vibration. When we can, not through the thought process, but directly. Just as the sounds are happening. As best we can.
And the mystery of that appearance. It's that allowing and making a space for just what is. With hearing, often there's an appreciation for a more natural spaciousness and witnessing. Maybe more ease of well being. Where we really do notice sounds coming and going by themselves. So that rest and relaxation that comes from not trying to control the silence and the sounds that are coming and going, just as they are. Another place that we can connect and feel grounded with earth element or with our hands. The sensations coming and going like the sounds within our hands. And that rest that comes from understanding. There's no need to try to control what is uncontrollable. A myriad sensations that are always new and passing away moment by moment. Finding our way to the movement of the breath at our abdomen, belly. And 
Again, that ease of just connecting, not with a memory, with the sensations emerging wordlessly, gently, just as they are. Nothing to get or get rid of. That spacious witnessing awareness that's not stuck into the experience. As we get more, <clears throat> more quiet, we can see the thoughts are always new. Never again, the same thought. Or an emotion, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Sad, happy. Disappointed, joyful. Angry, compassionate, kind, lonely. Peaceful, upset. Coming and going just like the sound, body sensation. Never again the same emotion. Sometimes really letting the attention incline toward grounding with hearing, hands or breath. And other times, just letting the attention Oh, that stream of moment to moment experience. Connected, but not controlling as best we can. With care. Compassion, kindness, ease.
Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Tim, we're actually not going to take questions today, just so you know. Yeah. This morning, uh, I learned about the death of uh, a great musician from Mali named Tumani Diabate. It looks like he died a few days ago, quite young. Uh, he was a kora player in a classical West African musical lineage he he is said to have been the uh, 71st in a, a line of kora players um and and not just players of that instrument and that kind of lineage of music but it's a a role uh and i don't know how to pronounce it griot g r i o t they're sort of kind of troubadours, uh, historians, you know, the people who protect the stories, you know, of the past and of the generations and uh, learn them and, and share them, but also in a way that's kind of, you know, reformulated, not totally beholden on the lineage, on the tradition, but offering them to the future as well. And just that idea of being the 71st generation <laughs> of anything is so amazing. You know, you think about what an incredible heritage and lineage and uh, pressure probably, you know, that was. And, and what a beautiful honor and gift he had. He had also, a, I think, a son who's also a musician, so he was keeping that on. But also, you know, in this era, he he had many other relatives and students and people who I think he was able to pass on a lot, you know, beyond this idea of kind of a direct lineage shaping the future by honoring this beautiful expression from from the past, you know, really moving. And it's, uh, yeah, just been alive in me, I think, some of these questions. So as of late, as, you know, many folks saw, my, my last grandparent passed away a few weeks ago my mother's father. And so, um, and some of my recent travels, last week I was out in Ohio uh, with my family and kind of trying to help uh, attend to his material remnants, you know, of his life at the same time to, you know, gather together and talk about him and honor him and, you know, just reflect on our times together. Mm. 
it's one of the kind of poignant and powerful questions I think that has arisen not just with my grandfather but of course you know other people in our our lives and the world this question about like who will care for the things that I cared about when I'm gone you know What happens to all of these things, you know, these little things, these big things? What is the lineage of caring, of caretaking, you know, that we hope for, that we feel responsible for in our own lives and what we have inherited in the world, in our kama? You know, where do we choose to take responsibility for some of these things and where don't we? Very powerful questions, I think. One of the kind of entry points for me has been uh, a few years ago when I visited my grandfather, I brought um, a kind of good recording device to record him playing the piano. He really liked playing um, I don't know, jazz standards from the 30s. And uh, his youth, you know. And so I recorded him playing and then recorded just a handful of conversations with him and hearing stories of his his childhood or his parents and you know, kind of wanting to gather those, you know, in his own words, his own voice, while he could still remember, you know, more or less the details. And so I have these recordings and a part of it was the idea as I was doing a radio show at that time that I would kind of compile them to, to make a show out of. And I'm, I'm no longer doing that, but it still feels like this sense of something very precious that I have. And, um, you know, want to be able to offer that to other family members and just to honor the his story, the music that he played. So I've been listening to them and he was telling, you know, many stories, but there's something a little bit kind of haunting to me about his own parents of these, um, His father was a, a piano player, a classical musician who had trained, you know, to play classical music. Um, and but was in, you know, Springfield, Ohio, as a is where he grew up and as a young man and became father and all of these things. And they're saying that at some point before he was married to my great grandmother the cincinnati orchestra came to springfield and he was invited to play the piano for the performance of beethoven concerto and it was sort of like a it was like a thing i guess that the orchestra did they would go to sort of more smaller towns and he was like the local guy you know who got to play with the the big city orchestra and Anyway, it was a big deal and he trained and he, you know, prepared a lot for it and and it happened and and then nothing else happened. You know, this, I think there was a sense that he maybe had a hope that it would kind of propel him to become a professional musician and to kind of be recognized for something and and that just never happened. You know, he, he would do, you know, I think uh, sometimes small accompaniments for other musicians that would come through, but mostly he was a piano teacher, you know, to the young people in the community and, and yet composed music. And I think had, it was something my grandfather sensed in his father's life as a kind of unfulfilled dream. 
And similarly with his mother, who was a painter and um, had trained and learned to paint and uh, kind of similarly, there would, you know, be Ohio exhibitions, you know, that you could submit your paintings to and get accepted or not. And, you know, she would have pieces accepted and they would be for sale and she never sold any. And, you know, it sort of just never amounted to perhaps what she had aspired to, you know, or hoped for or longed for in terms of being an artist. And I think that sense of unfulfilled hope was palpable to my grandfather. The financial reality of that <laughs> was certainly palpable, you know, kind of growing up and the strain that, you know, he talked about that they, you know, kind of lived in at times. And then going to Ohio, you know, it's like, here are these paintings. Here are these music scores, right, of my great-grandfather and my great-grandmother. And this question of, like, what what is to be done, you know, for these things, with these things? How do you honor something that was so meaningful to someone so long ago we may not even know or have ever known? And what is, you know, my responsibility or where do I take responsibility for things or do I not? Other family members, of course. And that's the, that's like the best of it. Then there's, you know, sketches and, you know, more things that are maybe easier to let disintegrate, you know, in a less meaningful way. And we have all of that, you know, these photos are like these people, no one knows who they are. You know, just gone. Where does it feel good to care for something, to find a home, to find a place, or, you know, is there some historical society somewhere that can file it away, you know? We'll see. My grandfather had a few suits, and I'm the only one who you know, basically fits into them. <laughs> he was much taller than I. So it's like, I don't live a life in which suits are like that useful, you know. People will get married. People will die. People may go to court. Those are the kind of scenarios that I can imagine. <laughs> And there's no tailor on the big island, you know? This is like, you have to go to Honolulu to find, like, you know, someone who can actually attend to these things. But I've taken them, you know, I have them because it feels like that edge of something still worth caring for, you know, even if I don't have a need for them or care about them in a particular way is something of that that feels on that edge of worthy of attending to for some next phase. My, when I was in high school, my girlfriend's father had passed away some years before I had never met him. And so I wore his suit to prom. And uh, and I still have that suit at my mom's house in Massachusetts, I've realized recently. 
and no one in her family seems to be interested in it, you know. Mm. It could be there isn't someone to wear it, you know. But I can't bring myself to get rid of it either, you know. Uh, it's like I can't just donate it yet. So that's that's perhaps more than just caring. It's maybe something more attached, more sentimental, they might say. But I do have this concern for things being appropriately cared for. Uh, even if it's let go of, you know, to hand it over, to, to feel like there's some thread of, of meaning and connection that carries something through, you know, uh, whatever that lineage might be. It's a, it's an important teaching for me of that reminder that love is not eternal. You know, love is not in our tradition, from the perspective of our tradition. You know, love is not something that simply exists and we just kind of find our way to or surrender to or abide in a kind of universal permanent love. You know, this understanding that love is impermanent. It, it can build momentum based on volitional action, but it requires the continued volitional action to keep moving through time, to keep carrying that energy through time. And all of these objects, you know, I see that. It's like, oh, the thread of concern, the thread of love, the thread of attachment, whatever it, the momentum of it dissipates. Where do any of us feel responsible for maintaining that caring energy through something that we have responsibility in our lives, you know, whether it's these objects, you know, whether it's stories, whether it's cultural practices of any kind, you know, whether it's a lineage. A memory, you know, we see how the human mind it's so fragile. Memories come to fade when we forget stories. They haven't been passed on. They're gone, you know. Where is that okay? Where do we have peace with that? Where do we accept the nature of story and being impermanent? Where do we take responsibility for carrying those forward to some measure? Is it through... What is the quality of heart in relationship to that? Is, is it clinging? Is it forcing? Is it tight? Is it tender? My, of course, you know, we all have some version of these. My, when my father passed away, similar kind of phenomena of, you know, he had a billion records a billion comics, a billion books, and this VHS tapes. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, okay, where we can donate, where we can move, where do we want to, you know, have some things for ourselves and recognize that this won't be cared for by anyone else in a way that I hope to, you know. And then what are the things that you can't continue to care about, you know? It's like the shows that he, or the videotapes that he purchased, you know? It's like, okay, well, my niece is into, like, antique technology, <laughs> you know? So it's like, great, she has a, the videotape player. 
but like all these recordings, you know, like the shows he would record. And I was like, I can't say that. I have to let it go, you know. But he had boxes and boxes and boxes of newspaper clippings from our town. When he arrived in Holyoke, Massachusetts at around five years old. My family, they were the only Latinos in Holyoke. It was like Irish, uh, French Canadian, Polish. Those were like the kind of predominant ethnic groups. And my family, that side of my family came from Ecuador. And yet little by little over time, uh, a lot more Latinos moved into Holyoke. A lot of it were, came through in like later in the 50s and the 60s, um, a kind of economic collapse in Puerto Rico. And there was um, farm labor jobs in Connecticut. Like my dad worked in tobacco fields in Connecticut. You know, cigars are, you know, you'll see Connecticut wrappers. That's where they grow the outside part of a lot of cigar tobacco leaves. And, um, and so he started cutting out newspaper clippings around anything that had to do with like the Latino experience in Holyoke from kind of early days to really big kind of phenomena that would happen, you know, and anyway, 50 some odd years of history. And when he was in the process of dying, his friends decided that this was a value this collection <laughs> of like unfathomable clippings you know had potential value and so i think it was almost a full year that he had four or five friends would come by once a week while he was like bedridden he was in bed and and he would he got worse over that period of time but they would come by once a week and just like dig in and they organize these things and they would base them on themes and they would categorize them and make, you know, do all this like cross categorizing. And um, I think before he passed away, right around that time, they were able to hand this over to a local museum, you know, and it was a place that was, longing to have more of a meaningful role in the kind of um, historical perspective, you know, of our town that wasn't just sort of like the dominant perspective. And so this has become a huge resource, right? People come from UMass, people come from all of the five colleges to like go through this to find stories and to find threads and to kind of dig through this material to like understand the history of this town and like the Latino history in particular of Holyoke and, um, and of Western Mass and of this era, you know, such an amazing thing for his friends to have done for him, you know, in those final months. And they're still traumatized by it, <laughs> but they feel good by it. You know, it's like, wow really amazing, you know. I've told a few stories of like, um, at times of just, you know, different aspects of kind of like the Indian cosmology and uh, mythology and kind of ancient sociology that I've been you know, reading up more up on and trying to understand more deeply. One thing I read recently was like an interesting kind of difference between where the the Catholic missionaries, um, you know, trying to kind of piece together a little more of what was happening in the Incan kind of worldview and cosmology that often is interpreted through the kind of, you know, the conquest and the kind of Catholic framework, Christian framework. But the idea of talking about a creator God and the sense that part of what might have mistranslated in terms of going from a 
Quechua to Spanish is the difference between creador and criador. And that really, this perspective is that there wasn't so much of a fixation on the creator God, but the criador, which is more like caretaking, raising. It's like... Um, uh, breeding like what you do with animals right it's like the caretaking for creation right for the beings of the earth and the plants and the animals you know this idea that pleiades the constellation was considered like a storehouse in the heavens of reciprocal symbols of all of the beings here so humans and uh, llamas and uh, corn and potatoes that that and this this idea of it was you know jupiter was responsible for kind of caring for this um silo this storehouse of beings that through caring for them up there they are cared for down here and this sort of reciprocal dynamic that people were responsible for in terms of the heavens and in terms of creating and uh, caretaking, you know, for that which is in our world and our lives. You think about how different a framework that is of between a kind of honoring a creator God and a caretaker role, you know, of these deities' roles. You know, how how do we relate to the world around us, the world within us, right? How do, what does it mean to sort of understand ourselves as caretakers, right? For everything, for our bodies, for our minds, for that which is unfolding in our direct experience, for the planet, you know, for our relationships, for, Again, our lineages, whatever it might be, you know, what does it mean to caretake? Where do we choose responsibility? Where do we not? Michelle and I are headed to New Mexico again this weekend to uh, teach at Vallecitos, which, you know, many folks here have been to or will be joining us. You know, it's a place that we have long history with, you know, different histories with, you know. And a place that I've cared about, you know, for many years and I've felt cared by, cared by, cared for by, you know, there's a relationship that develops, you know, over time going to these places, you know, so, and doing this work, I mean, of all things, you know, to be doing our work, you have a relationship with the land and the spirits of a place. And the last year when we went, you know, one of the, there are sometimes these just giant ponderosa pines, you know, through the forest and sometimes storms are just, you know, reality sets in and they'll fall and sometimes you'll hear them far away. But this uh this ponderosa fell while we were there, right towards the end of our time. And um went to go check it out. You know, it wasn't too far away. It was kind of in the on the ranch itself. And uh Amazing to see this giant being collapse, you know. Ancient, you know, these hundreds of year old beings, what they've seen, witnessed, felt. And when I looked at it, I saw a giant burl on this tree. You know, it's a place where a, a tree gets, will get wounded, you know, through some kind of physical harm. And over years develops this sort of, you know, 
layers of scar tissue around. Um, I've talked about these burls before because I, I do some woodworking and I'm, you know, bowl carver and spoon carver. And, you know, these are highly prized, um, highly sought after because all of that, all of the contoured and kind of convulsive and uh, wild grain that develops around of these injuries is quite beautiful, you know? And um, I just knew, I was like, no, I have to do the, <laughs> I was like, this is, this tree is just, it'll just disintegrate. It's gonna, which is fine. But here's this thing, here's this burl and no one else is gonna take care of it and make use of it and so uh the folks there helped me <laughs> an unbelievable chainsaw effort to get this thing off of the side of this tree and then i got a its own suitcase and i left this like sappy resinous giant thing uh you know, back to Hawaii where I knew I wasn't going to be able to deal with it for a while because I was traveling last fall. And, but I made this commitment to try to finish it, you know, before going back this year. And so I've had this, I've had this, I'm not quite finished, but I'm getting there. And so I have this giant, you can see this, this part of it is more like the kind of natural external side of it. And then the, the inner part, which will look very beautiful when I put oil on it, stuff like that. But I still have to do some more sanding. But it's like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take responsibility for this thing and bring it back there, you know, and, and offer it to this place because it feels right, right? It feels like a kind of reciprocity that is not, That's important. And felt important to me. So I'll finish it, probably, <laughs> and bring it. And this is actually a commercial for our retreat, our program coming up in. September for bull carving for Buddhists. If anyone wants to learn how to carve bulls, we will not start with a giant burl. We will start with a small six by six by four chunk of wood from someone I know in Western Mass. The link is in the chat. This question of seeing something through to the end caring for it in whatever way we can and letting it go, offering it, letting it dissipate, letting it die, letting it be destroyed, letting it find a new life. But carrying something, right? This is so much of what our practice is. You know, it's, you know, sometimes we can get so mechanical about the Vipassana practice. It's like, we're just trying to watch the breath or watch this or watch that and see, you know, get insight and, it's like we don't always honor that sense of what are we receiving? What is the strange lineage that this moment of angst is coming from, or this moment of joy, or this sensation in the body, this knee pain, this back pain? Is it ours? Is it ancestral? You know, whose is this body? Whose pain is this? Where does it come from? What are the rivers, you know, that have carried rivers of action. Past action, you know, where is it something that we ourselves have created? Where is it something that has been generated by others? Where are we the recipients of something? Where do we take responsibility for every moment of mind, of body, of seeing, of hearing, of smelling? Do we see ourselves as caretakers of these arisings and passings? 
so much out of our control, but yet still so worthy of our attention, of our kindness, of our respect. What is our role in all of it? How do we care without attachment? How do we honor something without clinging, without rejection? You know, do we have that relationship with the body? Do we have it with the people in our lives? You know, the the family, the friends. What relationships are we the inheritors of that we take on that we don't? You know. What are we willing to see through to the end? This is kama, right? This is, it's like that sense of responsibility. We are the inheritors of our actions. This is what the phrase is, you know, the equanimity phrase in our tradition, in our practice. And we create and then we inherit that, right? That which who has happened in the past shows up in front of us, you know? Where are the boundaries of our responsibility? What do we want to perpetuate? What are we hoping to let go of, to release from, to stop perpetuating? There's another commercial. There's a little essay I wrote recently about some of this kama as work. You know, that's that's one translation of this. It's just work, labor. We are the inheritors of our action. The world is the inheritor of our action. We are the inheritors of the action of the world, you know, of all of history. What do we, how do we brace and prepare the heart for that responsibility? How do we honor the burden of it? How do we recognize the challenges of that? The difficulties, the beauty of it, the goodness of where we decide to keep our responsibility? What do we decide to perpetuate or not? I've been working on my own will because all of this is alive. Who will I burden with responsibility for all my knickknacks? <laughs> what do we just let go of and recognize it will all be dust someday? You know, but where can it be of value to others? Where does that feel good? Where is that important to not waste the care that has carried something for so long? You know, how do we try to find something to be of benefit to others? Where is it too much of a burden? Where are these things that I, we may not care about ourselves. We may not we ourselves may not care about, but that we can care about the care that brought them to us, that we have a role to play in that, you know. And then where can we let go of it? Where where are we not beholden to the dreams of those who came before us? Where are we not imprisoned by those? Where do we let those dissolve, disintegrate? There's a, a phrase I see a lot now in these activist communities that's so beautiful, and I've never... <laughs> it says, uh, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. You know, and... Of course, there's something so beautiful in this idea of like that we may be manifesting something in our lives that is um, our ancestors, our 
people beyond before us and our heritage may never have even had the audacity to dream of, right? That there's a fulfillment of something, a deep longing, a deep aspiration that we are able to do. I've always felt not that. I felt more a sense that I must be my ancestors' weirdest dream, you know? <laughs> like, I can't just imagine being like, wow, that's, what is that? I don't think we want to head that way. And part of that's very explicit. It's like I, part of my deep longing is to put to rest all of these lineages to let them come to nothing. Mm. It feels like the most sacred, important potential of my life. And what a relief. All of the hopes and fantasies and fabrications. It's like, I don't need that burden. I don't even want my own. Where do we also extricate ourselves from that which only perpetuates suffering? But also maybe recognizing we can honor them without being beholden to them, without being burdened by them. But what does that look like? You know, it's a different dance. And of course, you know, there's no more profound truth in our way of that's not being beholden to the dream of ourselves. all of our fantasies, all of our imaginings, all of our longings. You know, again, it's like we can it doesn't mean we don't care about ourselves. It doesn't mean we don't care about the hope. It doesn't mean we don't care about the pain or the momentum of things that we want to care for and be responsible for and even if it's just bringing them to closure, bringing them to an end, providing a proper burial for the dream of the self. It's not angry, it's not resentful. But it is a release that is still takes responsibility, it still takes care, it takes knowing, it takes honoring, you know, the trajectory of our lives, the things we are proud of, the things we are ashamed of, you know, all that we have generated and all that we have received letting it all come to an end and doing that with as much care as possible as much sense of dignity and honoring of the powerful momentum of all of these things watching it all decompose, making use of it where we can. So thank you all for your presence here with us, with each other. 
And as I said, Michelle and I will be gone for a few weeks and because we, you know, we won't be able to uh, be here for the Sunday sittings, but we will have folks holding the space. So we encourage you to keep joining, keep sitting together for the next few weeks. I think it's three Sundays we won't be here. Um, but we look forward to coming together when we return. Mm. Take care of yourselves. <laughs> Take care of each other. See you soon. <laughs>